right. Good evening. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ruth. We are in chapter 4. We'll be reading verse 13 to 22. And as you turn there to remember that the Bible is a gift from God for the preservation and propagation of the truth and the comfort and establishment of the church. So if you would all rise for the reading of God's word. Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Then the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was a father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. And thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we finish the study of this wonderful little book, we pray that our minds would be open to understanding, Lord. Our hearts would be raised in affection. And therefore, our souls would be um, quenched of their thirst and satisfied with the meat of your word. Allow us to listen undivided, with an undivided attention and open ears, and all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So the main theme of Ruth, as we come to a close, to remind you again, is providence. Ruth is a book about providence. And while the Lord in our story has not directly intervened as by miracles or something of that sense, the story is clearly written and sustained by God himself. And so one question we ask as we come to the end here um, is, in th- that we should ask, we can ask and should ask, is why is this story even given to us in the first place? Why do we have the book of Ruth? Now, obviously, we can't know the exact answer, for uh, God's thoughts are much higher than our own thoughts. But we can know a little bit based on just what's in the scriptures themselves. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, speaking of the Exodus, But Paul says, now these things took place as an example to us. And while in, when Paul says that, he's thinking about how the Israelites during the Exodus fell and they grumbled and murmured and they were judged by God. And so he says, therefore we would flee from these things. But I think it also applies to the fact that there's good things that are examples for us as well. There are things that we can look to, things that we can consider things that we should truly meditate on that would help build us up. And in Ruth, that thing is God's providence. God's providence is on display so much that you can't help but glorify God for everything that happens in this story. And as we we think about what providence is, um, we have a definition here in the Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 5 and paragraph 1, it says, God, the great creator of all things, 
doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge, and the free and immutable counsel of his will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. I mean, what a, what a wonderful paragraph. To talk about how God does things. And also, why he does things. He does things for the praise of his glory. So obviously, broad answer, Ruth is in the Bible to the praise of God's glory. But more specifically, it's the praise of God's, just, uh, of God's providence, his governing of all things. Um, Psalm 145 uh, is actually cited in the Westminster in that, in that paragraph. And it's all about talking about God's providence and God's works. Sticky pages here. And it says, uh, starting in verse 1, I will extol you, my God and, my, and King, and bless your name forever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So there's praise and adoration happening for God. But then he says, One generation shall commend your works to another. And shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. The question is why? Because God's providence, his works, everything he's done was given to us so that we could recount these marvelous deeds and we could praise God. That's what God's providence is uniquely for. That's what God's creation is for, to, to create a theater to, to manifest his glory. That's what God's decree is about, the wisdom in, bringing, in, in expressing his gloriousness. And his providence is bringing all those things to pass. We can know for sure that everything in the Bible is meant for us to praise God. It's an example to us about how good God is, how good his works are and how we should be praising him. And even specifically, thinking about in that same chapter of the Westminster Confession, uh, chapter 5, paragraph 7, uh, the last paragraph, it says, As the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner he taketh care of his church and disposeth all things to the good thereof. And so the other thing we can think about as we look through the Bible, the story of the Bible, if you read it cover to cover, is that God takes care of his people. There's a special providence upon his people, his elect, his church. And so God's providence is meant to be good for God's people. And isn't that what we believe in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose? That's God's special providence. That's his goodness. And it's extremely praiseworthy. And so today I want to think about God's providence. What is what's called the end of God's providence? What is the point of God's providence? What in our section here points us to the purpose that God has in governing all things? And so that's where we get to our big idea today. God's providence is meant to bring about a brighter future, especially for God's people. God's providence is meant to bring about a brighter future, especially for God's people. So let's think about the text we're in now. In Ruth. What we have here is we have a bright future for all the characters that we've seen in the book of Ruth. All the providential knots are being tied together here. 
everything, this, 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 uh, this a tapestry, if you think about like a, like a yarn project or some kind of tapestry, right? Uh, when you finish a project, you sew in all the loose ends. And that's what you do at the end of a project. And so at this point, when we leave Ruth, there are no more loose ends. There is nobody that is unaccounted for. There's nothing unaccounted for. Everything is tight and good to go. All the people in this story are getting their happy ending. Boaz and Ruth are married. They have a child. And Naomi, who is the focus of our ending is also having her happy ending too with her child or, 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 or grandchild. Uh, obviously, those are within the text different. But this, at the end of the day, this child was a sign of Naomi's redemption. See, the story ends with everybody having their loose ends tied up. Ruth is redeemed, and now Naomi is also redeemed. But she's redeemed in a different way. <clears throat> Naomi as the focus is, is, is focusing on her redemption and her blessing, which is what's found in our text here. Uh, this blessing recounts God's works and points to the future. So you think about it, sometimes a reminder of the past gives us the greatest hope for the future. So the women here, as they are blessing Naomi with this child, are saying, uh, blessed be the Lord, for he has not left you this day without a redeemer. So that's what happened, is that that's what Naomi thought. The Lord was against me. That's what we read in, 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 at the end of chapter 1. But yet, the Lord has been good to her, has not left her without redemption. So I actually want to take the time to look at this blessing that's from the women and how it points to the brighter future that everybody has to look forward to. So let's first think about the blessing here that is here. So blessed be the Lord. This is a praise to God for his gift of happiness and favor. Uh, something we did a while ago as we did our dinner and devotions is we went through the Beatitudes. And one of the things that I stressed every time we did each one was that blessed, blessed or blessed uh, meant happy and favored. If you are blessed, you are happy and favored. And so it's one of those things that we bless God who is the ultimate happy one and the ultimate favored one uh, for, because he made us blessed. He made us happy and he made us favored. And so that's what's happening here is that, is that Naomi, they said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord because he's made you happy. Remember how the story began. Judges, famine, Moab, everybody dead. Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. But that's not the case anymore. God has redeemed Naomi and has now made her happy and favored. It's no longer bitterness that she dwells in, but happiness she dwells in. It's no longer the Lord is against me, but the Lord is favoring her, giving her unmerited favor, also known as grace. And so blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And this word for redeemer can also mean kinsman, depending on the translation you're using. But at the end of the day, she has a redeemer. And don't you think that's interesting that Ruth is redeemed uh, earlier in chapter 4, and now Ruth is talking about her being redeemed? Has not left you without a redeemer? Naomi's re redemption was realized when this child was born. I mean, it wouldn't be wrong, uh, per se, to call Obed, this child that was born to Ruth, a redeemer. Because think about it this way. Up until this point, the whole point of the kinsman redeemer is to redeem a family line. The family line of Elimelech, Naomi's husband, was dead. Up until now, a child was born and life was given. It was no longer a dead family. It was a living family. It had a redeemer. Not just in Boaz, but also in Obed, who would carry on the family name to keep them from being cut off from the earth. 
This child was the future for Naomi. This was her family's future. And she got to see it. She was able to see her own consolation before she died. This child was definitely a good thing. Not only was Boaz a redeemer of Ruth in the family line, but this child was the proof of that redemption. It was a proof that Naomi herself was also redeemed. The next part of the blessing, may his name be renowned in Israel. Renowned means famous or well-known or, or large. And we know that Boaz was renowned in Israel. Uh, later on, Solomon would name one of the pillars of the temple after him. But so is the family. This family, the, the child not only bears his own name, Obed, but he also bears the family name. And that family would be renowned in Israel. They would become the kings of Israel. Just like they said. He shall be a restorer to you of life and a nourisher in your old age. You think about it, to restore, Obed had restored life to the dead family line. He was a restored life in that sense. He was also something, someone that invigorated Naomi, gave her hope for the future. A son has been born to Naomi. It's, it's interesting that that's what they say. That's what the women say. They'll say, a son's been born to Ruth. A son's been born to Naomi. Naomi's been restored. Naomi has been brought to life. And to be a nourisher, Naomi ultimately was on her own in her old age, but now she had a son to care for her. And yes, she had Ruth, and the whole story is about Ruth taking care of Naomi, but the ideal, the ideal thing is that there would be a son to take care of his parents, to honor their father and mother in their old age, to take care of them after they've taken so much care of us, which is now not just a pipe dream for Naomi, it's reality. It's not a hope in fact, she didn't even have that kind of hope. If you remember in chapter one, do I have more children to bear? Would you women wait around for, even if I could have children? All hope had been lost, but this was the, re the restoration of hope. The hope of the future that as she aged, there would be someone there to take care of her. And we think about the next part of this blessing. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more than seven sons. And if sons were to care for their parents, Ruth would be like seven of them, like having seven of them to care for her. But I think it's also interesting about the seven sons is that it sounds like that Ruth's love for Naomi was almost better than sons. It actually echoes what David said to Jonathan when he said that Jonathan's love was better than the love of women. It's not that there was some weird thing going on there. It was that his covenant love was different, just like Ruth's covenant love to Naomi was better than sons. And sons were also a sign of the future. As, we as we've talked about, as we've gone through the Exodus series, when they killed the, first, the sons of the Israelites, what did they want to do? They wanted to weaken them. They wanted to destroy their future. And obviously, as we know, that when God... Uh, did the plague of the, the firstborn and killed all the firstborn. He destroyed Egypt's future. Egypt was utterly ruined at that time. And so we think as sons were a sign of the future, Ruth would have given Naomi a fine future. Better than ten, the love is better than seven sons. But brighter is the future with a son in, the, in hand or on her lap than sons in theory. See, Ruth had brought a bright future to Naomi, brighter than anything she could possibly imagine. It's important to note that marriage was Ruth's redemption. This child was Naomi. And that's why the women said, a son has been born to Naomi. This was how Naomi experienced her redemption. This was the sign of Naomi's redemption. The providence of God had brought everyone to a happy ending. It's interesting, at this point, if, if our story ends here, you could just say, and they all lived happily ever after. And you'd be right. What was interesting about our story, though, is it points to an even brighter future. 
a brighter future. There's a bright future happening here, but there's a brighter future that the author points to, and that's our second heading, a brighter future. While our story could end here, our author shows us something more to come. And this is the point of the genealogies at the end of this book. Why, why talk about these sons and grandsons and great-grandsons? It's because Ruth takes place in the time of the judges. That's what it says in, in chapter 1, verse 1. And then it brings us all the way to the great king, David. Ruth moves us from a tribal nation to a kingdom nation. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, why does David point, why does his name point to a brighter future? Why does it point to a brighter future? Why add this in there? And David is the king who ushered in the golden age of Israel. David was described as a man after God's own heart. He ruled well, and the Lord prospered the nation. When David comes into power is when they make great strides. And David is also the king in whom the covenant was made directly with him that points to Christ. God said to David, your son shall sit on your throne forever. And we know that uh, that's what it says in in, in a Samuel 7, where David says, I want to build God a house. And what does God say? No, 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 you don't build me a house. I will establish your house instead. And you think about also, as far as the golden age of Israel, I mean, David wrote many psalms. He did many good things. And, and they all point to the fact that, uh, that uh, this was a great age of Israel. He wrote Psalms like Psalm 110 that says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make all of your enemies a footstool. And so the Davidic covenant was the establishment of a kingdom. A kingdom that would never be shaken. A kingdom that would never really come to an end. It was an earthly kingdom that pointed to a heavenly one. Seeing David's name points to something more wonderful and amazing to come. Imagine, for a moment, you're reading the Bible cover to cover for the first time. And you've managed to get through the first five books of all the laws. You've gotten into Joshua. And then you see all that stuff, and God gives great victories and all this other kind of stuff. And then you, you go through the judges, and everything seems to go wrong all at the same time. And then you get to Ruth, and you see this short little story. And, and at the end, very end of the story, Obed fathered Jesse, who fathered David. It's interesting. But then imagine when you read in 1 Samuel. Now we're talking about Hannah, who's barren. She has Samuel. Samuel gets put in the tabernacle, and then he becomes a judge, and then they want a king. They find King Saul. King Saul is good for a little bit, but then he gets the kingdom taken away from him. All these things are happening. Until finally, Samuel's like, what do I do now, Lord? And he says, go to Jesse's house. I recognize that name. Okay, he goes to Jesse's house. First son, this must be the king. No. Second son, this must be the king. No. All the way down. Don't you have any more sons? Yeah, I got one. He's in the field. His name is David. Think about that just from a literary perspective. We saw that Ruth was pointing to something greater. And then you still have time before you get there, and finally in walks the shepherd boy. The one who was anointed king. You know, the, the story of Ruth was God's providence as a mean, means to the end of the great kingdom of Israel that it was. God's providence in Ruth shows that he took this nation, this wicked nation, and he still strengthened them to become more than they, than they ever were. They were a series of tribes that were then formed into a kingdom, a kingdom that glorified God. And that's what the story of Ruth is pointing to. It's a foreshadowing of this great kingdom. 
And that's a brighter future because there was a great golden age. That lasted for David and then it lasted with Solomon for a while until it, until it broke after him. And the golden age was over. But it's important to note that these things point to something even farther beyond the horizon. There's the brightest future. The brightest future that we can look for. David and the covenant made with him points even beyond the golden age of Israel. Because we have to know as we read the story that the, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, the, they eventually petered out. They eventually fell. They eventually were exiled. And even though the religion of Judaism didn't necessarily die out, the kingdom did. And while on earth, the kingdom may not have been as visible, but the spiritual kingdom was alive and well. The spiritual kingdom of God was rock solid, unshakable. And, and, and that's one of the themes when, when you're reading the Bible post-exile. All the books that are post-exile. Think about Daniel, you think about Esther, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah. These things, it shows the kingdom of God is still strong and is still prevailing. In fact, the book of Esther is a great example of that. Here's Esther. She's all the way in, all the way in Persia. And someone wants to destroy every Jew. And yet it's one random Jewish woman in Persia that saves all of them. They don't have a kingdom here on earth. There's no king of the Jews that fought valiantly for him. Who fought valiantly for the Jews? The Lord of hosts fought valiantly for the Jews through Queen Esther. And that's the whole point. That, what then does this point to? Who does this point to? Jesus Christ. He's the hopes and fears of all the years. All the things in the Bible are shadows that are cast by the great monument to God's goodness and providence, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the one who ushers in the brightest future for all of us. Jesus Christ is the one who is the light that casts out the darkness. In fact, in first, the thing about Jesus as the brightest future, as the one who ushers in the brightest future, he's actually the ultimate fulfillment of every blessing that is in Ruth chapter 4. Jesus is the redeemer who this day we have not been left without. He's the kinsman redeemer who we have not been left without. This is what Romans chapter 5 verse 6 is. For, for while we were still weak, while we were at our lowest, at the right time, God, Christ died for the ungodly. He's the Redeemer who we, were not, who we were not left without. Jesus was also the one whose name shall be renowned in Israel and in all the world. Philippians 2.9 Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. He has, his name is renowned in all of Israel and in all the world. Jesus is the restorer of life. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not suffer in death, but shall have everlasting life. He restores life. He restores that which is dead. Adam and Eve, in the day you eat the fruit, you shall surely die but Jesus Christ restores that life. Jesus is a nourisher of us in our old age. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul, at the end of his life, is saying that I am not ashamed, for I know who I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what was entrusted to me. Think about that. At the end of our lives, we know who we believe in. We know he guards everything until the final day. Even in 2 Timothy, it says there's a crown waiting. I'm being poured out, but there's a crown waiting for me and for all who love his appearing. That's a nourisher of life in the old age. It's what invigorates us to continue living while still looking forward to Christ. Jesus is better than seven sons. Jesus' love for us is better than seven sons. 
Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 5, it says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Jesus is better than sons and daughters. Jesus is everything in this blessing to the infinite best degree. There was a bright light that shined when this child was born. There's an even greater light that started shining when Christ was born. An even brighter one that shined when he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. An even brighter light to come in the new heavens and the new earth when there will be no more sun or moon because the Lamb himself will light everything. Can you think of a future more bright? That's the whole point. Jesus is all of these things. And he promises all of these things that are better than we can imagine. As is quoted, what no eye has seen, what nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. We can imagine brightness. We can imagine the bright future. But the fact is, it's beyond even what we can imagine. That's who Christ is. That's who this son that was born to us, that was given to us, that's who he is. That's the future we have to look for where where we will dwell with him in everlasting light in the greatest life, face to face, free from the presence of everything evil. It makes me think of, uh, it's been quoted before, but it's worth quoting again. You know, there there are words, sometimes there are ways that we try to express things and we can't really do it. And this is one of those things I can't really express. But C.S. Lewis, I think, summed up this in his book, The Last Battle. He said, The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of of all the stories, we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. And now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than before. It's, uh, that's what we have to look forward to, brothers and sisters. When we trust in Christ today, the future that he has uh, guaranteed for us is brighter than anything we could possibly think or imagine. And that's the thing that we take away from Ruth here. It's that example. At the end of Ruth, they all live happily ever after. At the end of the age, so will we. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that when you when you chose to create everything, when you decreed everything, and as you govern everything today, that you do it for your glory. And your glory is the most wonderful, precious thing that we could possibly imagine. And Lord, we are humbled by the fact that you chose in your goodness to include us to enjoy that bright future ahead of us, to enjoy the celestial city beyond the river, to enjoy life everlasting in your presence, face to face with your Son. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we think about these things, as we meditate on these things, that we would truly have our affections raised, our hopes anchored to, to within the veil to your Son, the great high priest who has cleared a way for all of us. Heavenly Father, when, 
when we are tempted to sit in our darkness and bitterness, Lord, remind us of the future ahead of us. Remind us that this life is just the, the cover and the title page. There's more to do, and it gets better with every chapter. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.